what I've done is I've titled my, my talk From Exploration to Delineation because I think that Adelaide Resources now is in a position where we, we're not really an explorer anymore. We've actually made the discoveries. The job in front of us now is to if we can uh, profitably dig them up. So let's, uh, let's launch into it. Um, just a little bit about the company for those who don't know. We're, we're South Australian based. Uh, we have a very tight commodity focus on copper and gold, which are two metals that we think have a bright future. Our projects are in uh, principally South Australia, but we also have projects in the Northern Territory and in Queensland. And they're all in terrains uh, with geological pedigrees that can deliver company makers. And we think that that's a, a wonderful attribute of the, of the exploration assets that we have. Uh, our main um, projects are 100% owned. Uh, which uh, I think maximises our shareholder exposure to and means we're in charge of them as well. We spend, uh, you know, virtually all of our exploration money goes on drilling. Um, uh, and, we, and as I said, we've made some significant discoveries in the last few years and we're now in a, a stage where we need to uh, drill these things out and see how big they might be. Uh, and just to finish with our, our flagship project, is in South Australia on the York Peninsula, which is the foot-shaped peninsula off to the, uh, the west of Adelaide. Um, uh, and it's an area with a, a long and proud copper mining history. Uh, a, little, a little bit about our corporate stats. The company's actually been around for a while. It listed in 96. Uh, we have about 230 million shares on issue, which I think after 17 years is a reasonable position to be in. It's a few unlisted performance rights and things for staff and executives. About 3.8 million in the bank at the moment as we, as I stand here, which is a reasonable position for a junior, I think, in these what have been fairly tough markets over the last 12, 12 or so months. Uh, our top 20 hold about 36. Uh, market cap uh, of about 16, 16.9, I think at 7.4, I think we closed uh, lower than that uh, today. So there's a, a brief introduction. Some of the people. Our chairman is a geologist called Mike Hatcher, uh, a history with uh, groups like Newmont and North Flinders Mines. Uh, myself, I'm a geologist as well. You've got a lot of geologists uh, around tonight. We also have an accountant and a, and a mining engineer, John Dendriver, who was part of the team that built the, uh, the Granite's Gold Mine for a mining engineer. And we have a, uh, an, an accountant who worked at Olympic Dam and a, and a geologist, Mark Manley, who's our exploration manager. Uh, helping me out on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a little graph that just shows how much we are putting in the ground. Uh, it has uh, so what we what we can see on here are those those blue um, columns are the amount of money that we've spent shareholder funds. Uh, the extensions in sort of pink on this slide here, uh, contributions from joint venture parties, uh, and the little yellow line at the bottom is our annual admin spend. So what we like to do is to, to, to see the majority of the funds obviously go into expiration. Uh, it's come back a bit obviously in 12-13 because times have been pretty tough. But despite that we've actually had this year, probably the, in the, the whole history of the company, the most exciting expiration results ever. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about those. Uh, our projects, as I said, South Australia, Queensland and the, and, uh, the Territory. We're going to go down and, and have a look at this Munter Copper Gold project on the York Peninsula of South Australia. It's only about an hour and a half's drive from Adelaide. Very, very handy. Um, now, uh, for those of you with a, a bit of a knowledge of Australian mining history, this was an area uh, that was critically important to the early economy of South Australia, the discovery of copper at uh, Kadena and Munter, uh, and then the um, establishment of smelting and export facilities at Wallaroo were, were very important for the, uh, for the early economy. Uh, and between them, these three areas, uh, these three towns, were the, the, the corners of what was called the Copper Triangle. Um, and um, we have a very simple goal uh, uh, on, in our project, and that's our tenement, EL4961, that surrounds the Copper Triangle. Our goal is very simple. We want to turn the Copper Triangle into the Copper Polygon. So we want to add a few more, uh, a few more production centres to those historic uh, mines at Munter and, and Kadena. What I want to do is, um, if you have a look at this slide, on the left there's a, a, a sort of a broad, a broad slide showing a, a, a big brown belt of uh, geology which is called the Olympic Copper Gold Province. And this is a world class uh, piece of the, uh, the world's crust. Uh, it hosts the deposits of Prominent Hill and uh, Carapatina, which Oz Minerals have. Obviously the, the giant Olympic Dam deposit, 
a range of other uh, prospects just down to the south of us, Rex Minerals Hillside deposit, which looks like it might be the next one to uh, uh, go to development uh, amongst this area. But it's a it's a belt with fantastic pedigree and uh, you know a place that you can really find uh, big deposits. So what I want to do is actually, before I zoom in on our tenement, I want to actually have a bit of a look at this belt to try and set the scene, to give you a bit of a feel for, uh, for what we have here uh, on offer. This is, uh, it's a few months old now, this map, but basically this is a, a map of the tenement position, expiration licenses that are granted in that belt. Now here I've used a purple outline to show the Olympic Copper Gold province. And the messages are pretty simple. The first one is that every bit of, bit of ground that you are allowed to peg in this belt is pegged. Um, the, the second message is that the companies that are active in this area include a lot of the world's largest copper, copper miners and producers. We have you know, Antofagasta, BHP Billiton, obviously Fortescue Oz, uh, Rex Rio Tinto, Sandfire just north of us, down on the York Peninsula Straits, Extrata Glencore. Uh, so, you know, some of the world's biggest miners. So we're, we're privileged to have a significant uh, holding in this belt. I suppose the other one which I find somewhat amusing is that even the waters of Spencer Golf are pegged, so there's an unlisted company that couldn't get anything on land but they've pegged a bit out in the ocean. Um, the, the, the next point that I want to make is that uh, uh, the, the depth down to the perspective rocks within this belt varies greatly along it. And if I draw a very, it's a very schematic diagram, I'm sure the South Australian government geologists would think I was being very rough and ready. but. The message is, uh, is a correct one if the, if the, uh, uh, the section is a little somewhat lacking in its, its, um, uh, you know, with, with its faults and things. But basically, if we go from the north up there, uh, from A down to B, and we sort of draw a line down the middle of this belt, we can see the depth of cover sediments, which are barren, and we have to go through both for exploration and mining, varying quite dramatically along it. So Prominent Hill has about 100 metres of cover sitting above it. Uh, Olympic Dam is just over 300 metres. Carapatina is close to five. Uh, and so very significant depths that have to be overcome to explore this area if you are up in the northern area. We then come, come down to the Spencer Gulf, which of course is underwater. Uh, and then the last little bit on the right hand side of that schematic section is the York Peninsula. And I've marked the position of our project, the Muta project, and you can see that the cover depths there are as shallow as anywhere along this belt. And then hillside's probably got, it's still pretty good, it's probably 30 metres of cover or something like that. But we have one of the easiest places uh, to explore in terms of the depth of this, uh, of this cover, which we have to overcome. Uh, and if we just zoom in, this is just a zoom in on the York Peninsula, Adelaide Resources Tenement there in blue, some of the other significant players, I think, obviously Rex Minerals have the ground in yellow, which includes the hillside deposit. And uh, as of uh, uh, sort of fairly late last year, Sandfire uh, Resources, who of, of course would be well known to many in this room as the discoverers and then ultimate developers of the De Grusa copper mine in, in Western Australia, have joint ventured into the ground immediately north, so it's got their tick of approval. Um, now I want to sort of talk briefly about the history of exploration for just the area that we now control. Uh, and, and, and really, although there was, there was uh, mining activity back about 150 years ago, exploration in the modern sense uh, really didn't start until 1959, when Western Mining Corporation pegged tenement uh, over, the, over the area. And then some years, uh, short years later, they did joint ventures with, principally with North Broken Hill, uh, Broken Hill South was involved at one stage as well, but they controlled this area for about 30 years. Um, and they did a lot of work, uh, which I will talk about in, in a minute. Following that, they, they sold the, the tenement to a, a syndicate of WA miners, called, which, which I've just shown here as the Amalg joint venture. They, they, they really had a production focus, digging up a couple of small things that Western Mining had found. Uh, Adelaide Resources got involved in a small part of the area uh, back in 95 when it, or 96 when it, when, it, when it actually first listed, but only about 106 square k's. And the rest of it was then it being explored by MIM. Uh, and then they exited and then Amalg sort of did a deal with BHP Minerals, so another major that had a go. Uh, we then had an opportunity to acquire all of the, the ground, which we did in about 2000. 
and we then joint ventured it to Phelps Dodge Corporation, who was a major US copper, produ copper moly producer. And then they were in there till about 2006, spent, a, spent a quite a bit of money, did a lot of work. And then we've had, it, we've had the run of it since about 2006, and it's really, uh, it's, it, it, which is really when we've really kicked up our, our work here, or more recently. On the top, you can see the copper price in US dollars per pound for that same period. And I guess it's, it's nice that the copper price is at sort of historically high levels uh, for pretty much the period that we've had it. So we have a couple of advantages that come our way as a consequence of the history of, of exploration of this area. The first one, I suppose, is that the big boys in here, the BHPs, the Phelps Dodge, the MIMs, the Westons, they were looking for very, very large deposits that would satisfy their corporate targets. And so there's a scale opportunity potentially for a company with a market cap of 17 million. Um, and the other thing is that they actually did a lot of work, these guys, and they left behind um, a, you know, a wonderful legacy of, of past exploration. Now, some of it's not digitally captured, which we have to do, but it's, worth, it's, it's literally worth millions and millions of dollars if we had to go and do it again. A lot of it looks like this. These are old handwritten and typewritten logs that have never really been properly captured by the government or any other explorer that we, we're aware of. Uh, so we're going through and, 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 and um, digitising all of this old data, sorting out all the problems in its location and that sort of thing, and it's a tremendously valuable extra data ship, probably worth about 30 or 40 million. So just to sort of summarise on, on those, uh, those first points, we, we're in a world-class province down here uh, where uh, many of the world's largest copper miners are active. We have some of the shallowest prospective rocks in this whole belt, which opens up, uh, it obviously has a, advantages both uh, while we're exploring it, but also if we move to mining, obviously the shallower the better. Um, we have the benefit of this tremendous uh, uh, database of historic we have to capture, but that's, as I said, is, is very, very valuable. So, uh, and we're, we're operating at a time when, when, when historically copper prices have been better than they have over the, the sort of the modern exploration period. I know costs have gone up as well, but they're, they're still pretty good. Now, what we're doing is, now I want to talk to you about some of the results of what we've achieved this year. And I've, j I've jumped straight in. I should have had a slide in here which showed you where this prospect Alford West is. It's up near the sort of central Alford West, about 10 minutes wholly within the, in, in our ground. Uh, it strikes east-west, so it doesn't leave out our tenement. Basically, um, uh, the, the prospect was really first defined by a very shallow auger drilling that was completed by Western Mining and North Broken Hill in the 1970s. And what they did, they marched across the paddocks. This is all wheat country with a, I'm not quite sure what it would have been, a tractor or a small four-wheel drive mounted auger rig. And they just augered down to maximum depths of perhaps 30 or 40 metres at most. Most holes are sort of 10 metres deep or something like that. And then they assayed the samples. And that's that yellow sort of outline that's on this, on this plan. Um, uh, and then the background image here is magnetics, by the way, which we'll, we won't bother too much about. You may have trouble seeing this, but there's a, lo a lot of little white dots on this plan. And they're all the drill holes that we're aware of that have been drilled either by ourselves this year or by historic explorers uh, into this, uh, this big anomaly. Now, the little white squares on this plan are one kilometre by one kilometre, which gives you a sense of the scale. And if you, there's a, there's a, a box there in, you know, with a dashed black line around it, which is where we've focused our drilling this year. If you have a look to the west of that or to the left of it, there's very, very few drill holes that test about the next two kilometres to the west of this anomaly. So the anomaly's been defined, but it's never been really properly drilled, and I'm very excited about what we can find out there as we extend our drilling. Now all those little green dots are the collars of uh, the holes that Adelaide Resources has drilled, uh, drilled this year, and the black, the blacks, or the white ringed black dots are historic holes as best we can place them, and we don't exactly know where some of these are uh, by old explorers. And I just want to show you a couple of cross sections, three cross sections, so we don't get too sick of looking at them. One that's right over on the western boundary of where we've been to date, and then a couple that are back in the middle. So if we look at this western one first, it's a bit busy, I know, but those drill, the drill holes are those little black angled uh, lines going uh, from sort of top right to bottom left <coughs> with their depths on them. 
Uh, any little, um, oh, the, the, uh, the geology is the background. There's a very thin cover in yellow uh, that you can see at the top. That's probably averaging on this section about eight metres thick. And then we have some weathered rocks, upper, upper saprolite and lower saprolite, uh, and then down into fresher rock uh, at, at depth. Everywhere there's a little green box, we've got copper mineralisation or gold mineralisation in excess of 0.1% copper or 0.1 of a gram of gold, so low grade. Uh, and then the red box is with the annotation of the better hits. So I've just ringed a couple of them. There's 11 metres at 1% uh, copper, 12 metres at uh, 0.4 copper and 1.5 one, uh, one grams of gold, and a big intersection of 50 metres at point of low grade uh, copper at 0.4. If we move, uh, I think it's about 700 metres to the east, here's another section. We've got some wonderful intersections here that we achieved this year. 20 metres at 4% copper, which is a really real standout result, but around at 11 metres at 2.3, 18 metres at 2.2, 10 at 4.23. So very, very good grades and really quite shallow, as you can see if you look at the scale bar once again. So within about uh, 30 metres of the surface, and our last section, just to finish the, the, the little section section, uh, here's some more, 14 metres at 2.645 or 1.56. So re th these are very, very encouraging uh, uh, sort of uh, intersections for copper that, that lead us to believe that we'll be able to define a, a pretty good grade deposit here with more work. Some of the uh, individual numbers, they're all sort of uh, averaged in the sections, but here's a a photograph of some of the drill chips that we've, 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 we've uh, dug up. And I'm just showing the copper and the gold grades for these two holes. And you, you have a look at those coppers down there, five and a half, six point six, thirteen, eight, two, twelve, twelve, seven. 12, 12, 7. Really, really good grade stuff. And there's some good copper in this other hole here, but what I really like in here is the gold grades, seven, eight, two, two, seven, four. So there's some good, good high-grade gold as well in, in places in this, uh, in this deposit. You're not supposed to read this. This is just a, a big, long list of intersections, but I guess the, 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 the points to note are that the from depths, and remember these are all angled holes, so they're not really quite as deep as this, but the from depths are shallow, the intervals are good, and the copper grades are high. Uh, so I think that that's what we're seeing uh, develop with here at, at Alfred West. What I want to do is uh, try and give an impression of where this thing is at the moment and where it might be going. As I said, I think, think we're in a delineation stage for, for Alfred West. And I'm going to compare it with the deposit that's just down the road, which is owned by Rex Minerals. Uh, their hillside resource, which is 330 million tonnes at about uh, 0.8 copper equivalent, I think is their published, uh, late, most recent published resource. And we've taken a plan that they released in an investor presentation late last, or October last year. We've redrawn really it to simplify it a little bit, but we, we've honoured everything that they, they had on it. Let's have a look at what Alford West would look like if we were to plot it up the same way as, uh, as this plan that's in the Rex thing. Well, the first thing that we can do is we can draw on the auger anomaly that I showed you, that yellow blob. It's three and a half kilometres long, so it's, it's actually slightly larger in terms of its strike length than, uh, than hillside is. And the auger geochemistry that they did, as I said, these holes only really just scratched the surface below the cover. But they achieved some very significant results, and I, I hope you can just see, just sitting underneath the cover there, there's three little red bars. Uh, and they're areas that would um, satisfy the parameters of that, that Rex pl plan uh, at, the, at the bottom. So although they uh, only went very shallowly, they, they intersected some pretty encouraging grades of copper in their own right. So we have you know, mineralisation of sort of Rex grades coming all the way to the base of cover. What we've done ourselves and, and others, so far it's, it, it doesn't look like much. Uh, there's the sort of middle 1.1 kilometres that, that we've drilled in some detail this year. There's those three holes that I mentioned that are way off to the west. And then the rest of it really just hasn't been drilled so far. But our view is that this thing has real potential to grow significantly as we do more, do more drilling. And, you know, it's pretty simple to see what we have to do. Those areas that are marked never been drilled, well, we have to do shallow drilling there in the first instance, and that's what we want to do as soon as the crops come off, this, uh, off these paddocks uh, around Christmas time. 
uh, and then we, you know, the thing remains open at depth, so we need to start pushing it down at depth and start to grow, grow the size of this resource. So uh, that's basically the uh, the Alford West story, which has really been the thing which the market's focused on with us this year. Just to sort of sum up, as I said, about a 3.5 kilometre long target zone, only about 1.1 kilometres kilometres of it drilled in any detail at this point. So there's a lot left to uh, get the first drill holes into. Coherent zones of high grade mineralisation, some of them persisting as shallow as five metres below surface, which is very very positive. Uh, and as I said, a very obvious forward exploration plan. We know exactly what we want to do, what we need to do here, and you don't have to be Einstein to, to see that, that what, we wa what we want to do is, is makes, makes a lot of sense. So, and, and we think exceptional potential here to define something of real value. What I want to do now is, it's not all just Alfred West, I want to sh just sh point to a couple of other deposits in this same project. This is one we call Willamulka, which we discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, it's about a 1.2 kilometre long zone of mineralisation, but the best part is the southwestern sort of 550 metres, and there's just one section we'll briefly look at through here. Intersections like 17 metres at 2.6 copper and a gram of gold, and 8 metres at 1.3 copper. So pretty reasonable stuff in its own right. We're modelling this guy at the moment. Um, this is what it, what the mineralisation envelope to Willamooka looks like, and all those little yellow, this isn't sort of like an oblique sort of seagull's eye view, I suppose, or Sydney Tower's eye view of what it would look like if we took everything but the mineralisation and the drill holes away. The drill holes are those little white, uh, little yellow uh, lines. Uh, it's open along strike to the southwest and at depth, uh, and it will contribute, we think, to a sort of a project scale resource position. Pascoville we found last year, another deposit, it's about 350 metres long, it's open along strike, it's open at depth. Fairly complex section, but I think the team have pretty much got the geology right here. I think it's a series of stacked copper mineralised loads. Again, there's some interesting intersections. The best one, probably 42 metres at 1% copper, so that's a pretty good hit. Do drill down dip a bit, but there's some other good ones across it, like 8 metres at 2. And that one should be able to make a contribution to a, a resource position. Wombat, which is named after the first discoverer of copper in the district, the first copper Signs of copper were found in wombat burrows where they dug up some green, uh, green copper carbonates. Uh, uh, an intersection again that we achieved last year, 66 metres at 1%. So there's a lot of copper in this district, there's a lot of deposits. And what we've got is we, we call this our Munter Exploration Triangle where we've actually listed all of the prospects and targets there in green and they're ranked depending on their sort of status uh, vertically and they're ranked in, in, according to their sort of quality from a left-right point of view. The goal obviously is to, to increase the quality of them and move them up the list, but um, uh, there's a very, very strong pipeline of other stuff to, to come after. So let's just uh, finish up with Mooter and I just will then talk very briefly about some of the other company's assets. Very, very widespread pros prospectivity for shallow copper gold. And I mean, we, we've basically been finding one a year for the last three years out here. Um, uh, they are deposits that, that hold together. Uh, we can build a resource uh, base around these, which we're working on at the moment. Um, as I said, this mineral inventory is now starting to emerge uh, with uh, Willamooka, Pascoville, Wombat, uh, Alfred West and whatnot. Um, and it's really transitioning, as I said, from a sort of discovery phase through to a delineation phase where we are about building that resource position which hopefully the market will reflect in, in an increased market cap of, uh, of the company. Just very briefly to finish off, I just want to quickly touch on three of our other projects. Rover in the Northern Territory, uh, the Air Peninsula down in South Australia on the other peninsula and then uh, we'll duck up to Queensland and have a quick look at Drummond very, 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 very quickly. Uh, Rover is a Tennant Creek style play, which is also a copper gold district. Um, we have two tenements off to the southwest of, of uh, Tennant Creek. These have about 100 to 200 metres of barren cover above them, so they have an impediment uh, there, but we've made some discoveries at Rover 4 and Rover 1, which are shown on that map over the, the last few years. Just one very quick section. Rover 1 actually is a deposit which straddles a tenement boundary. Uh, the southern part is owned by a company called Metals X, who you may uh, may be aware of. They've defined about a one for them and a precursor company that they merged with called West Gold Resources. 
have defined about a 1.2 million ounce gold equivalent resource immediately south of the boundary and luckily for us some of it crosses the boundary and this is a, a cross section through part of it. All of those intersections on this plan are our intersections, they, that's metal that belongs to Adelaide Resources and we believe that, that these deposits, they, we don't think they're big enough to build a mill in their own right unfortunately but we think that they're big enough to contribute should say the Rover 1 deposit to the south uh, uh, cover the capital cost of a mill and have some value for us. The Air Peninsula Gold Project, uh, we've got it all back. We did have a joint venture looking for uranium here with a company called Quasar, but they exited in uh, February this year. Uh, we found some gold here in the past. Uh, the area's also been on the, uh, I guess, in the market side because of the Paris Silver Discovery made by a company called Investigator Resources, and that's shown on this plan as a, the location of that little blue dot, which is in a tenement that abuts out. And we have, for example, a, a prospect which we, or a deposit, which I call Baggy Green, uh, when we discovered in, in deference to Steve Waugh's love of his hat. Um, it's uh, a big geochemical anomaly that's got, you know, gold mineralisation proved in drilling. Really not a lot of deep drilling uh, to really show what might be there, but some pretty encouraging results. And here's a cross section. We've got intersections like 24 metres at 2.4 grams gold um, and, you know, 49 at point about 0.5 and things like that. Very shallow dipping. Um, so that looks pretty interesting. We'd like to get that one working again for our shareholders. And then lastly, if we just duck up to the Drummond Basin in Queensland, uh, we have a, a project called, I guess the tenement we call Glenroy. Uh, it's again, it's 100% owned. Now, this is an, a, a, an area where we fi find a style of mineralisation called epithermal gold. Uh, you might have heard of the Pajingo field or Vera Nancy which is located in the same rocks about 80 kilometres to the west of our ground. Um, we've got uh, historic work but done by past explorers that we think confirms that we've seen the right styles of gold mineralisation here, particularly at a prospect called Limey Dam, uh, where we've got about a five kilometre long zone of anomalous gold and anomalous rock chip samples, a much earlier stage one, but epithermal gold systems can be very, very attractive targets if you, if you find a good one. So. Uh, Basically, uh, just, to, just to sort of finish off on these other projects, we've got a couple of deposits at Rover, up at Rover, which are Tennant Creek style, and which we think can make a, uh, a sort of a monetary con contribution to Adelaide resources at some stage in the future. Some interesting gold deposits and silver potential on the Air Peninsula, uh, and this uh, confirmed epithermal system up in, up in Queensland that needs a bit more work. And I think that together with, uh, with Munta that we heard about to start, with this is really quite an enviable portfolio of sort of you know very high quality exploration assets. Um, so it's not just uh, going out doing greenfields work. It's really about drilling out resources and trying to really get to that point where we can add significant value for shareholders. The very very last slide. We've got a lot of drilling that we want to get cracking on as soon as the crops come off early next year, uh, particularly at Alfred West to test all of these wonderful targets that we've got there. Um, we, we want to start building this uh, resource position, as it were, or this uh, mineral inventory, uh, so that we can demonstrate to the market that these things uh, will have some value. Um, we'd like to find another one next year. As I said, we've found one each year for the last three years. It'd be nice to keep that, that, uh, that going in 2014. Uh, and we want to try and get some shareholder value out of these, these other projects that we have uh, at Rover Air Peninsula and Drummond. So uh, thank you very much for your time. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you very much, Chris.